Virginia called 765 latent variable methods course, the graduate course in mechanical engineering. Um, I'm Kevin Dunn, and I'll start off just with some credits. This course isn't entirely my work. Um, in fact, Dr. John McGregor used to teach this course here. In this very room, I learned this material from him back in 2000, September 2000. Um, but he'd been teaching the course since 1990, I guess. I'm not 100% sure. And then he finished teaching it up when he retired around 2008. So John McGregor now still is active in this area of latent variable methods. Um, not publishing so much, but he has his own company here in Hamilton that works in this area. And I will follow the outline he used to teach this course. Basically, four or five weeks of theory where we learn latent variable methods, PCA and PLS. And then the remaining term, we'll be looking at applications and going really in depth into various applications of these latent variable methods. So that's the general structure of the course. Um, I also just thank MACC, particularly Vlad Mahalik and Chris Schwartz, who um, pushed for this course to be reinstated after John left, it wasn't on for a while, and so this is the first time that it's back. So they, they pushed for that and I agreed to teach it, uh, and I'm excited to teach it. I would absolutely do it for no money at all, but Dr. Zhu has decided to pay me as well, for it, so thanks to him for finding it. Uh, I have finished up here in uh, not yet, around August 2002 with my master's with Dr. Schwartz. Um, I'm not a prof for a doctor, so just call me Kevin. Um, not Dr. Dunn or something like that. Um, I do run my own engineering company, uh, Connect MV, and I work full time at Blackstone. So, so, so Monday to Friday, I commute backwards and forwards, and I take Friday afternoons to come teach this course. So, because of that, I don't have an office on campus. The best way to get hold of me is by my email. Um, and to be honest, some days I get home and I just don't want to open my email. So if you don't get a reply from me right away, it's one of those days. Uh, I'm having a bottle of red wine, enjoying the life of it. But um, try to email me, press to me, push me along, and I'll, I'll definitely get back to you soon. Usually within two, three days. Just some admin issues about this class. I am video, re video recording the class, the camera at the back. And I'll post the videos online in a couple of days, of course. A few of you have already emailed me and told me I'm going to be away this Friday or that Friday. You might miss the odd class. So that's a good way to catch up. I wouldn't rely on that as a way to, to get through the course. It's really there just for convenience. Um, so, so use that as you wish, the video. But the website is really cool, though. I will post post notes to the website. Usually two to three hours prior to the class starting. And I'm sorry I can't post the video because of uh, my work schedule. I pretty much only prepare the notes and slides a few hours before the class anyway. Well, not, not, that's not when I do it. I kind of work through throughout the week, but I finalize it two, three hours prior to the class, post them to the website, and then um, there's a gap of time for you to download them. So please bring them to class. Today I, I, I've run out of um, handouts, but in the future I won't bring any of them, so we'll do that. We'll talk about software later on. And then references. Okay, so this course has no textbook. Latent variable methods are not that new, but no one's written a textbook that works for this class. Um, there is a textbook that's specific, very specific for chemistry. There is a textbook that's very, very mathematical oriented. I'm not in either of those two camps, so there's nothing that I can really use. My best source of material for this course is a variety of journal publications, usually by John McGregor's group, which is my bias because I studied with him. Um, but uh, there's also a variety of other papers, and one particular that's assigned for this week is by Swanty Wald, which is a group out in Sweden. So um, we'll, we'll get to that at the end. That website, though, literature.connectv.com, contains all the references I feel are important for this course. It's fully searchable, like all the PDFs are text, uh, has text and optical character recognition. When you use the search box, it's scanning through all the PDF content, so it's a pretty powerful website to look for any sort of concepts related to latent variable methods. Um, and if you're on Mac's <laughs> campus, uh, you can get the PDFs. If you're accessing it from home, you won't be able to download the PDF for copyright reasons, but because you're on campus, it's part of this course, you can then get 
in some of the PDFs. And, and some of those PDFs are pretty hard to find. Uh, some of the journal articles are not easily available in the library or through the normal electronic uh, li uh, lit journal website. So, so you, you'll, you'll read that site from time to time. Okay, and uh, big class, graduate course. Many of you, this is your first graduate course you're taking. Uh, you've come from undergraduate straight to grad. Uh, some of you, you're in the PhD program for a while already, so this, the style of a 700 level course is not, uh, it's not that familiar to you. But I do want to just say the following. Uh, I'm not here to teach you how to learn a piece of software. I'm not here to show you where to click around on your computer to solve a particular problem. We will learn how to think about latent variable methods, how to interpret every equation that we, we encounter. What does it mean? How can we use it to make money, improve our processes? Okay, so you're gonna to have to think through the concepts and it's gonna be very frustrating for you in the first two, three weeks. Even when I teach this course to industrial companies, I've taught it about seven, eight times to companies in Canada, US, Europe, and so on, the people that take this course get so frustrated after the first day or two because it's not the normal way of thinking about things. Totally different way to start to think about things multivariately. We're so used to looking at things univariately, one at a time, that to try and understand stuff multivariately is not hard principle, but it takes a while. So uh, we're going to be doing a lot of discussion in this class, a lot of talking amongst ourselves. By no means are you going to just sit here and listen to me uh, teach to you or just talk, okay? Um, that includes the people that are auditing the course. If you, even if you're not taking for any grade, you're going to be asked, I'm going to ask you questions, you're going to have to maybe come up here and say what you thought about the paper that you had to read the previous week. When we do assignments, there will be questions that you'll have to answer in the class. It's not the sit back and let the stuff wash over me type of course, okay? So, that, from all those perspectives, this course might be very different to anything you've taken before. Uh, so here at the end of it, I want you to be able to solve data analysis problems and learn that there's not a single right way or wrong way of doing it. I use latent variable methods, I use least squares, I use simple graphical tools from time to time, depending on the case. So that's what you're going to master by the end of this course, is knowing which tools to use and when, not where do I click on the software to make it print a graph that I want. That's not, not what I'm here to teach you. Those of you that go out into the industry and use these tools, there's a few big companies in this area that provide software around this. And most of those companies will teach you courses like that. Where do I click to generate this plot? I want to see my prediction error. I click here. That's what they teach you. But they don't teach you what prediction error means and how to interpret it. Okay. Those big companies will sell you a course for usually in the order of two and a half, three thousand dollars for three days to go and listen to then teach you how to learn their software. But by the end of it, you still won't understand these tools. So from that point of view, this course covers the same body of work that those companies offer. But I really like this format where we've got three hours for 12 weeks. We can really go in depth and understand what the tools mean, not just where do I click and use the software. Um, I thought I'd just include this. This wasn't from this particular course. This was another course I teach here at the university. This guy wrote back to me a few, uh, after he took it and says, um, I refer back to my notes all the time. That's always nice for me to hear. But uh, what he says he benefited is how to look at data, represent the data in the best possible manner, because he has to look at a gigantic amount of data to try to make sense of it. So what he was referring to there was a part of that course I taught on data visualization. And I'll, I'll cover that again today a bit. But then this next part was interesting. What he enjoyed most was thinking about the, pro the course and how you get to a solution. Uh, the pro process involved in thinking about the data, not just the final result that you get. Okay? So that, that's what I want to emphasize in this, this course as well. Okay, being realistic, you're in university, at the end of this you want to grade. How are you going to get that? Well, about four assignments, 5% each, 20% total for that. Um, and each assignment is a couple of pages right up. So there may be one or two data sets that you have to look at and answer a few questions on and hand that in, we'll discuss it in class. 
and um, there won't be solutions. The discussion in class will be the solution, and uh, then I'll create the assignment return class. Class participation, as I mentioned, I'm going to have you all introduce yourselves in a minute so I can get to know your names and faces and what your interests are. Um, and based on that, I will then assign, as we go through the course, an impression of your participation in the class. You will be asked questions, even if you're auditing the course. Um, I'm not going to discriminate between those taking the course officially or not. And then the biggest chunk of the grade is a project. So that's the standard way of running the graduate with 700 level courses. A project at the end, and ideally what you want to do is take the material from the course and use it to make uh, some sort of case study or form a chapter in your thesis. Right? So always the concept of getting two for one. I get my grade for 765 and a chapter in my thesis from the same piece of work. Okay, that's not plagiarism if you do both yourself. You use it like that in this course. So please, in the back of your mind while we're going through this, think how can I use it, where can I um, get this benefit of getting a course project and a chapter or a case study in my thesis going. If you can't find anything um, like that, we'll work and, and try to find a particular case study for you, for your project. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll, you should find, the fact that you're here means that you're interested in data or you've got data analysis issues or the problems that you want to solve, it's probably part of your thesis and research, so it's usually easy to find that overlap there. Um, and then the real assigned course vector grades the same way as, as the university does for the other courses. Okay, any questions on that? Overview and admin stuff. Boring, boring stuff. Let's get to the interesting things. So this uh, slide is pretty small. Um, I hope you have a printout in front of you. Let's go through what we will cover in the entire 12 weeks of this course. Okay, so by the end of 12 weeks, you can come back to this picture and, and, and really see how everything fits together. So we'll be talking about this part up here today, extracting value from data. And that's what I see as the objective of this course. Latent variable methods, I see PCA and PL as, as nothing more than these squares. Okay. These squares is a tool you've learned maybe in high school, first year, second year, fourth year. PCA, PLS, nothing more than these squares. There's nothing special about these. It's just another tool to solve a problem. Okay. So what we're going to look at first though is what sort of problems might be solved with these interesting tools. PCA, PLS, or any other tool, design of experiments, these squares, whatever the, the tool is. We're going to look at a general approach to extracting value from data. Next class, we'll be looking at PCA. Probably for about two weeks, we'll go really in depth into the theory of PCA, how the PCA models are calculated. We'll look at uh, the interpretation of the PCA models. Then we'll move over to PLS. Uh, PCA. Maybe we even might, I haven't quite planned out how this layout will be. It might be two to three weeks here. Because this is the basis of all latent variable methods to a large extent. If you get PCA, you can get PLS, and you can get some of the other latent variable tools that are out there. Uh, in PLS, we'll again look at interpretation, theory, and we'll look at empirical models in general. We'll have a short discussion on empirical models. <coughs> the last half of the course, for about five to six weeks here, we'll look at applications. We'll look at experiments in the latent variable space. How can I design an experiment in, in the latent variable space? How can I develop a new product? We'll look at batch data analysis and image data. I'll talk about these a bit later on today as well. We'll look at the concept of classification and discrimination. Um, I don't have too many slides in the, or any slides in this today, but the quick idea of classification is if, um, if I want to look at, I get data from my process and I want to say at the end of the day, this is a good product or a bad product. I'm making a, a classification decision on good versus bad. And there's many, many classification type problems out there. Um, often they do to, will this consumer buy this product or won't, won't he or she? Okay? So we'll look at that. It's an extremely powerful way of using these methods and you can make a lot of money 
with this tool. Um, and I'll talk about it in a few ways. Yeah. We'll look at adaptive models where you need to update your model when you get new data and new information coming in. Your, your existing model needs to be updated. Um, we'll look at the case for multiple data sources. And I'll, this is going to be a big concept coming throughout the course. And then how to optimize and improve the process. Yes? What's the relationship with this subject with data mining? Yeah, data mining, I guess, is another way of talking about uh, many of these concepts. So data mining is uses tools often including latent variable methods, but then they'll use things like trees or support vector machines and so on to often achieve the same objectives that we talk about here. Okay. So I, I'm not that approach. It's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's another group of tools. And in fact, you could call this course data mining. If I wanted to be buzzword compliant and <laughs> make sure that my website got many hits, I would call this data mining course. But it's, it's a bit of a, I don't, the, the, the association of mining for data kind of says that I'm digging around hoping to find something. Well, no, I'm going to look at it from a different perspective. I know I want it, I've got these goals here. I either want to troubleshoot my process, I want to learn more about my system, I want to predict, or I want to optimize my process. How do I interpret my model to achieve those objectives? Whereas data mining is more, here's a piece of software, and, and it usually is like a data mining. So companies like SAS and IBM will sell you these software packages for data mining, and there's usually very little knowledge about what's going on underneath those tools. So I don't like that that term too much, but it, you could call this course data mining. It's an interesting way of looking at it. And then finally, just to wrap up here over here, there's this concept of data pre-processing on the side, which doesn't really fit into any one of these areas, um, but is an important step that we do before we go use our data into PC and PLS. So in fact, next class we'll talk about pre-processing as well. Okay? Now, Enough of me for, for now. I want each of you to come up here to the front. And you're going to face the class, okay? Not just sit down. You're going to come up here to the front and face the class. Tell the class your name, what your interests are, and, and which department you're from. And the reason why I want you to do that is I want you to tell that video camera at the back so I can go home and learn all the names. <laughs> because my Alzheimer's is kicking in, and I really need some help to learn your name. So please. Come up and clearly state your name and introduce yourselves to the class and, and let us know just a little bit about what your research in this slide is. So if you want to go first. So I just wanted to put this out here as a, as a broad overview of where we get our data from. Uh, to me this is tremendously exciting. We're seeing almost all the data on this side of this uh, plot in the last few years. This is more the traditional area of data sources, but we've very rapidly come and started adding in all these other data sources here over on, on, on the left. So I just wanted to give a bit of a, a broad overview of this, and then uh, we'll take a break. So the classic source of data is good old manual measurements. You go ask someone a question, like the census, the Canadian census that was just done this year for the first time, they did it over the internet. But the same idea, they ask you a variety of questions, you answer, they tabulate those data in, in large databases. But the chemical industry has benefited from these data sources. We are really now considered extremely cheap census for $1,000, $2,000, sometimes a bit more. You can easily get a temperature probe hooked up to your system flow rate, pressure, uh, dimensions on various units of, if you're producing parts, you'll be measuring the, the dimensions. I know um, I just started working in the pharmaceutical industry. Every 30 minutes, they take a whole bunch of tablets off the line, and a guy sits there with a caliper measuring the size. And if it's out of spec, they stop the line and make adjustments to get in spec. But, and, and that's all automated. They just dump the tablets onto a machine that does takes care of all of that. PH, all of these sensors, pretty inexpensive, collect lots of data, and are hooked up electronically to databases to record that. Another way, which most of you who are doing um, any sort of experimentation here in the department, you'll be doing lab, labs, experiments, 
take a sample and then you measure a couple of variables on each sample afterwards and you record that probably in an Excel spreadsheet or a text file somewhere and that's your, your source of data. Chemical plants have also started adding tools that measure concentrations of a stream. So inline gas, chro gas chromatography devices um, have been common in the past 20 years. And also the idea of a data historian. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later on, but it, all that a data historian is, it's an automatic computer system that kind of sits in some corner of a, well, a chemical plant usually and archives the data as it's, um, as it's coming from the, from the process. And then that data gets used later on to varying degrees, or sometimes not at all. Image data is pretty interesting. Um, image data is obviously for liquids and solids. We can't image gases. But the image data source has only really been practical from an industrial point of view in the past 20, 25 years. We started with grayscale images, color images. Now more recently, off the shelf, you can buy an industrial color camera for about $5,000. And then if you want to spend a bit more money in your 20,000, you can get cameras that will measure in the near infrared and higher wavelengths. Um, so we're getting a lot of image data now on chemical process, particularly for solids. If we look at that, compare that to this case over here, temperatures, flows, pressures, pH, we can measure that very easily on liquids and gases, but there's never really been any easy instrumentation for solids. So any company producing food or tablets or any form of solid product, uh, plastic polymer pellets, they've never really had a way to deal with <coughs> verifying the quality of that product in real time. But image data now gives them that potential to do that, and that's where a lot of that has just recently uh, come through. Batch processes, I'll talk a bit more about batch processes later on, and their special structure of data. Spectral data is um, literally just a probe, just a, a pure probe that is put in line on a process or used in a laboratory, and the sample under that probe reacts to a particular wavelength of light that's, that's transmitted through that object or onto that object, and then the absorbance of the light back from that probe measures either a near-infrared spectrum at various wavelengths or UV spectrum. And I'll show a bit of examples of that later in the slides here. Another one that's very interesting are these acoustic measurements, uh, so accelerometers. Is there anyone from mechanical engineering here? There was, I think, uh, there is a person from coming, but I can't make it to today's class, but they've used acoustic measurements for many years. That measures vibrations. Every car that's produced and tested, will they'll go through rigorous, rigorous acoustic monitoring to make sure that vibrations transmitted from the engine don't annoy you in the, in the passenger compartment of the car. So they, they engineer ways to minimize that vibration transfer to you in the car. So your life, your life more pleasurable. Um, but these acoustic measurements, you can take those vibration data and, and look at them in the time domain or in the frequency domain and get very useful information out of that. One project I was involved in was to put these devices on, on a person's knee. So if you put your finger on your knee and you swing your leg, you can feel things moving and, and vibrating around there, right? And the older you are, the more cranky that's going to get, and creaky, or more cranky, creaky. So what we did was we put these sensors on, on people's legs, had them swing their legs five to ten times, and we could predict whether they were getting osteoarthritis or how far along they were in getting osteoarthritis. The normal way to tell that is to have the person sit in Health Canada's very expensive MRIs and wait months and months to do that and spend lots of technicians' time to get the same value. But if you can just have the guy or girl put a little sensor on their knee, swing it a couple of times, and you predict their level of osteoarthritis, you save tons of money. Uh, so that's a very powerful way to use acoustic measurements. Uh, every time you go to the grocery store, every time you swipe your debit or credit card somewhere, 
you're making some form of transaction that's logged. And it's logged to you, where you made it, what you bought, um, and, and maybe some other factors. Was there a discount involved? So if I go to Fortino's and I buy 20 items, every single one of those items is tagged back to me. They log it against my debit card. They built a single entry in their database of that transaction. Every customer going through, they get an individual transaction. And at the end of the day, they can use that database and make decisions. Which store needs more soap or needs to stock up on a certain item? That's the most obvious way. But the other way is that they can say, well, people in East Hamilton buy more of this product. So if we want to advertise, if we want a promotion on that product, that's where we should put our effort. There's no sense in advertising to people in Western Hamilton if they're less likely to purchase that product. So the powerful uses of these transactional databases, when you use these loyalty cards and your Air Miles card or whatever uh, card you happen to use, there's a reason why you get that card for free. It's because you're the, you're the product that that company is selling. Your information is being sold to derive advertising revenue for someone else. So you're getting the card for free, but you're ultimately the product um, for that. So we, we'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, medical data is a new form of imaging that's um, readily available now. Most hospitals have, well, almost any hospital here will have an MRI, CT scanner, ECG to measure the vibrations or the signals coming from the heart. And there's so many medical imaging uh, types that I can't list them all. That there's uh, new ones being created um, every year. There's something new coming through for medical imaging, and those data sets are huge. MRI is a five-dimensional data set. Uh, it's X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z location by wavelength and time. So it's a five-dimensional data set that's coming through, um, and, and you can use that. And we'll talk a bit more about this. these large cubic data sets later on. Then a new a newish data type is geographical data. Well, the first one, latitude, longitude, that's not new at all, but the easily the easily availability of data now is um, of GPS data is, is crazy, right? I mean every everyone of you with a smartphone probably has GPS capability on it. You can you can track your current location, your speed, the how much distance you've walked, all of that can be collected um, and, and used as a form of data. Companies now put GPS on all their fleet vehicles and track um, where, you, where um, like so if you're a driver for Union Gas, they can track if you're actually visiting the customers you're supposed to visit, how long you spend on your breaks, etc. from that GPS data. So there's probably a few more that you can think of that I, I haven't listed here. Just a few more others uh, of, of uses of data and, and interesting data sources, and then we'll take a break. <laughs> if um, I ever go back to France again, I will definitely be visiting this bridge. I think this bridge is awesome. Look at it. It's, it's, uh, it used to be, if you wanted to travel from Paris to Barcelona, there's a huge detour around here, but then this bridge span has really made it a much shorter trip. But such an elegant looking bridge. Those uh, that tallest. Um, mast here in the center is taller than the Eiffel Tower. Um, I forget the exact distance of the bridge. It's a, it's a couple of kilometers long. Beautiful arch. But what's interesting is how instrumented it is. Every single one of those pylons have uh, wind speed accelerometers that I was talking about earlier, that acoustic uh, vibration sensor. In kilometers, which I forget exactly, extensiometers are uh, push and cool, I think, and temperature. They'll detect movement on that bridge right down to a very uh, small level. They monitor for oscillations being set up by wind and stresses and strains from the traffic. <coughs> and those sensors on the bridge, they'll gather all sorts, of all matter of data, weight, speed, density of traffic. And in fact, they can use all that data collected up here, and they can do this next step. This is classification. They can predict 14 different types of vehicles. So large truck, small truck, small car, large car, motorcycle, uh, car with caravan, etc. So you use this data as your input, and you can predict this as your output. 
that's an example of the classification. But isn't that amazing? Like what, how much they're collecting and so much data, hundred readings per second alone from that main center pylon, and the data's got uh, transmitted through about twenty kilometers of Ethernet fiber that's, that's wired on the bridge. This is not just for bridges, they do this for buildings now and all sorts of uh, infrastructure is wired in this way. Okay, so we're, we're, we're getting overloaded with, with this data. This is just a single bridge, but this data is tremendously useful for predicting when should the bridge be shut down if there's a, if there's a wind that, that um, may lead to unsustainable oscillations on, on the bridge that can shut down the time or that even from a preventative maintenance point of view. Which parts of the bridge need to be shut down for maintenance? I heard uh, recently, actually, there's a competition on the internet right now. This just reminded me back up here on GPS data. Using the, you know how most of your phones, if you do this and you do that, the, the screen switches around, right? Um, I forget the name of that sensor. It's an accelerometer. So your, your phone obviously has one end. Most phones do, or iPads or tablet computers have that sort of thing. So, from the accelerometer data in Australia, I think the municipality of Sydney has collected a data set with people riding around with their cell phones recording the accelerometer data. And you go over a pothole and your phone does this and it records that bump. So every day a thousand people drive over that same location, you've got the GPS and the accelerometer information, marry them together, you can figure out where all the potholes are in the city and you can say, that's where the engineering crew needs to go fix the biggest potholes. So you're combining that these data sources up to solve a useful problem. Formula One, I don't follow Formula One, but I just found this uh, tidbit here. Each car, extremely instrumented, they'll collect about 20 gigabytes of information on a single race. 46 megs per lap that's transmitted in real time wirelessly to the base. So that's not a not significant amount of data at all, but when the car comes back in, they, they get the rest of it, and it takes three servers to process the data from each car. And they use that to plan maintenance and determine when is the optimal time to have changes made to the vehicle and so on. Um, and they'll send this from this real time data, they'll crunch through that and send advisories to the driver on, on what. Uh, that the driver should be doing. Aircraft, extremely in instrumented with multiple levels of redundancy. Um, that's, that's to be expected. And we're all very familiar with how aircraft can pretty much be flown uh, entirely without a pilot, based purely on the sensor information. Um, and chemical plants, we're, we're starting to enter this age where we're getting wide variety of these new sensors, and we're not quite sure yet what, how the best way is to use them, but we're getting near infrared cameras and visible cameras for solid and liquid products, as I described earlier. Acoustic sensors are used to monitor machinery. Any, any rotating device in a plant or any vibration in a plant can be monitored with acoustic sensors um, and to determine when a pump's vibration signature is very different to what it should be, and then it's obviously an indicator that that pump should go and be maintained. So rather than just shutting the pumps down and maintaining them whenever, if you have an acoustic sensor on each pump that monitors that signal, you can then predict when the pump's behavior is not, not normal anymore, so different from its usual signature. Um, in line, near infrared and UV, this is often, these spectral instruments are often called PAT sensors, uh, PAT stands for Process Analytical Technology. Thanks. I should know. I'm in the pharmaceutical area. And the reason is that pharma has dri driven the PAT. So the FDA in the United States had this big wake up call a few years ago where they said we need to be doing latent variable data analysis. We need to be using these advanced sensors. And so this uh, PAT initiative came through and it often results in these near infrared and UV data. Uh, and I'll show you a bit of those next. Um, and then, interestingly, chemical plants are using a lot of wireless signals. So the new technology for chemical plants, you won't see this in any existing plants, it's expensive to retrofit, but newer plants, they'll be having these mesh networks that talk to each other 
And as an engineer, I can walk through the plant with this, and I'm walking past the distillation column, and it says, hey, something's not right with this distillation column. Because it knows my geographical location, and I can then, okay, zoom, let's look at the data from this distillation column. What's, what's not going on right with it? Let's pull up the model for that column and see what's not matching to expected behavior. So that's, that's um, I know even at GSK we use a lot of tablet devices, but we use them for stupid things like starting the reactor, stopping the reactor. I mean, come on, we can do so much more with this data than just starting and stopping the equipment. You can be getting real-time data, visualizing it in your hand on the plant floor. For those of you that want to make money in your spare time, if you were around doing this course a few years ago, we would have probably looked at this data set. Netflix had this annual price, a million bucks for any group that can do improve over their recommendation. So any of you who've used Netflix knows that when you sign in, it tells you, you've seen these movies, we recommend you see this other movie, okay? And what happens is after you've watched a movie or a series, you'll say, I think this thing had three stars, or four stars, so you give it your star rating. So Netflix published this data set annually, and the, the most recent one had 10, uh, 100 million rows, uh, 100 million ratings right, from that many users on 17,000 users. So an extremely sparse data matrix. If we had to draw that data matrix, I guess it would go something like, you'd have one column for every movie, so 17,000 odd columns, and then you'd have users down here so if user one only watched three movies and they gave this first movie a one star rating, they gave movie 99 a two star rating, they gave movie 17,000 a four star rating. Then user two didn't watch those three movies but maybe watched 16 other movies, they'd give those, those corresponding ratings. And all the rest of the state is empty, right? Because this user didn't watch well, not all users watch 17,000 movies. So extremely sparse data set. And if you could manage to predict, they had a testing data set that you didn't get. And so they gave you this training data set that would hold a testing data set. You can get some on the testing data set, if you can predict what the user's ratings would be for certain movies, and you could improve your, their, your recommendation is better than Netflix's recommendation on average by, I think it was like four or five percent improvement that you could make over this, you could win a million dollars. And, and they, they awarded that prize for three or four years, and then someone decided to sue them because they believed that this data set violated their privacy, and so they don't, uh, they don't run this competition. Even though the data was totally anonymous, someone managed to correlate the user data with IMDB and then figure out which user was which and then they said, oh, this violates my privacy. And so now the competition's over. But if you do want to win much more money, here you go. You've got until next two years, 2013, to win $3 million. And what you need to do is, you, well, okay, firstly, the background is here, $30 billion is spent on unnecessary health care. So people who say, oh, I'm feeling sick and ill, I go to the emergency room, and they don't really need to be in the hospital. So the aim is to predict how many days in a year a patient will actually spend in a hospital from their previous visits to doctors, their previous claims, their medical claims, prescriptions, the lengths of previous stays. And that data, that competition is running right now. It's the Heritage Health Price Competition. Uh, there's a lot of money. Okay, so a lot of interesting uses of data, a lot of interesting data sources. Okay, now we'll take.